One of the very first Indian words to enter the English language was the word loot. <laughs> loot uh, was a word unknown outside the uh, Hindustani heartlands uh, until uh, the mid 18th century. Uh, but it gained rapid um, uh, success and uh, uh, rooted itself in English uh, in the late 18th century. And if you want to understand how this happened, uh, you could do a lot worse than to visit Powys Castle in the Anglo-Welsh marches. From the outside it looks the archetypal uh, National Trust property that, as if uh, um, some uh, wonderful Jane Austen actor were to swagger out in, in breeches and, uh, 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 and uh, uh, delight us all. But uh, go inside and you find a very different world. Next slide. Because the Powys is filled with more Mughal and Indo-Islamic loot than any single one collection in India. There are swords and shields and elephant armour, uh, ivory, um, uh, some quite major pieces of, uh, of Indian uh, national treasures. Next slide, including, uh, we're looking through here, Siraj Dalla's palanquin abandoned on the battlefield of Plassey uh, in 1757. And if you go through the arch at the far end of the room, which you can see at the end of the slide, you find yourself in Tipu Sultan's, um, <coughs> Tipu Sultan's campaign tent, uh, uh, which once presumably uh, was erected uh, in uh, Lalbagh or uh, in, here in Bangalore, somewhere around the fort. Uh, and this is because this, is, this castle is the resting place of two generations of Clive's family uh, winnings uh, in this country. Uh, and uh, if you want to understand what happened, you could do a lot worse than to look at the picture uh, under which you pass on your way into this treasury, into this kazana. Next slide. It's not a very good picture uh, by Benjamin West, an artist who characteristically never went to India. Uh, and when it was first, uh, thank you, and when it was first um, put up uh, in the National, uh, uh, in, not the National Gallery, in the Royal Academy, uh, one critic pointed out that the dome in the background had more in common with uh, our venerable St. Paul's, he wrote, than anything you were likely to see in India. But what it shows is very important. In the centre, you have a Mughal emperor in cloth of gold handing a document to a slightly overweight, powdered and periwigged Georgian gentleman. And this is uh, Clive, Robert Clive, passing the Diwani to Sorry, this is Shah Alam passing the Diwani to Robert Clive. Uh, and uh, this is really a crucial moment in the history of both countries. From the time of Pliny, who complained that Roman ladies had developed an insatiable taste for uh, Indian diamonds to hang from their ears, uh, sandalwood bodies to uh, rub on their skins, sandalwood paste to run, uh, sandalwood paste to rub on their bodies, and um, uh, silks to wrap themselves in. From that time, gold and silver gushed from the West to India. Until this moment, when it was as if a switch was turned and the gold started heading in the opposite direction. Because this document, known as the Diwani, which is a word that means really nothing to anybody either in Britain or in India today, uh, but which, I suppose, translated into modern English, you could call it a document of involuntary privatisation, uh, was forced onto Clive, onto Shah Alam by Clive after his defeat at the Battle of Buxar. And what he did, what did this document uh, uh, had the Mughal Emperor agree to, was that a private English company, headquartered in just one English office in London, this is it in the middle here, five windows wide at the time of the Battle of Buxar. Um, it's not even the two buildings on either side, it's just the five in the middle, considerably smaller than the building we're now in. Uh, and a uh, hundred years into its history, there were only 35 employees in the head office of the East India Company. Even at the peak of its power, it never sent out more than 2,000 Englishmen to Bengal. 
Yet, in a twist of fate, it was so improbable that if you were to hand it to Netflix as a possible storyline uh, in a series, you'd be laughed out of court because it's such an unlikely outcome. This one company, based in this one office, took over the richest empire in the world. At the time of the founding of the East India Company, the rural empire was generating around 28-29% of world GDP. England was generating just under 7%. And yet, it's this one company succeeded in taking over uh, the moguls. Uh, in, in an outcome so unlikely that uh, uh, it, it seems difficult to credit. And it did it by borrowing money from Indian financiers to build up an Indian army staffed 95% by Indians to conquer other Indians, which it did in as little as 50 years. Uh, and it paid double the going rate that uh, Tipu, for example, was paying. Um, and in this way, between 1757 and the conquest of Delhi in 1803, the, uh, the East India Company managed to assume control of almost all this country south of the Himalayas. It turned itself into the biggest multinational corporation uh, of its day. It built half the London Docklands. By the uh, 17 uh, 90s, it had uh, it was building in its do uh, docks at Brunswick around 700 clippers a year to move textiles because initially the company grew on the back of Indian textile creation under the Mughals. To get it, particularly in sort of uh, in modern India, the Mughals are regarded as these uh, feet figures lying back on couches with sort of Ritik Roshan being sort of fanned by a Shwari Rai. Uh, but what is often forgotten is that. And from the Shah Jahan's period onwards, for the first time since the time of Ashoka, uh, the Mughals uh, put India ahead of China as the world's le leading exporter and industrial producer. And it did that uh, through largely textile exports, silks, uh, kalamkaris from the, from the coast, uh, the Andhra coast, but to particularly cheap cotton. Uh, very high quality cotton that was exported so widely by the East India Company that by the end of the 18th century, there's deindustrialization as far away as Mexico for the sheer quantity of Indian imports, uh, particularly of cotton. And so the East India Company makes its money shipping Indian goods around the world, particularly uh, by the end of the 18th century, opium, which is shipped to Hong Kong, where it's illegally sold. Uh, tea is bought, which is then shipped to India, to Europe, uh, and finally to America. It's of course East India Company tea that is dumped in Boston Harbor at the Boston Tea Party. So by this stage, the, the East India Company has become this sort of monstrous multinational straddling the globe uh, with uh, uh, interests in all these different countries. Uh, and uh, uh, it has created the largest, the most powerful capitalist organization uh, in history. It had an, its own army. People again tend to think of the, com the company as being sort of manned by white British people. But there was, by 1799, 200,000 Indian sepoys trained, armed, uh, and drilled by the company, which was twice the size of the British army at the time. Under the control not of the government, but of the shareholders and directors working still in that one small and yet, behind all this, there is another parallel story. Uh, and this is the story uh, of the degree to which individual company employees, never the company itself, the company was about making a profit in the same way that Goldman Sachs is about making a profit. No one joins Goldman Sachs for its corporate responsibility program. Uh, they, uh, they, they join it because it's, the, it's a very efficient uh, uh, engine for creating wealth. Um, but, and the company spends nothing uh, on, uh, on infra very little on the infrastructure and, and certainly nothing on the arts. But individual company employees take more of an interest in this company. And it's a very different world 
to the world of the Raj after 1858, after the East India Company has become nationalised. Um, there is none of the world of the whites only clubs. There's none of the only dogs and Indians on the uh, similar mall. There's none of the civil lines and the uh, and the separation of the cantonments. Because at this period, one third of the company employees, according to their wills, are leaving all their goods to Indian women or to Anglo Indian children. So while it is uh, a period marked by extraordinary plunder and looting, it's plunder and looting that's done in an oddly collaborative way with an Indian elite, particularly in Bengal, where uh, Bengalis uh, are investing very heavily in company bonds, which is paying for the wars against the Marathas, uh, where the Jagat Sets and Gopinath uh, and, the big, uh, and the big bankers of Allahabad are competing to fund East India Company campaigns. And you get this world, where, which is very different from the world we know so well from Kipling or Curzon or, 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 or all those uh, dramas of separation. Because the company is integrated into Indian society in a way that the world, uh, the Raj never was. And while John Munwell, a Yorkshire chartered accountant from Coxwell, sits wearing his Mughal Jama, down River in Patna, Ashraf Ali Khan is making the reverse cultural journey. He's still wearing his Indian clothes, but he's sitting on a Chippendale chair. Uh, and his hooker is resting on a Georgian teapoy. Uh, and he has got his duties on the ground, uh, and he is uh, very sensibly uh, sitting cross-legged, uh, as if on a, on a Muslim or a throne, but his, uh, his girlfriend, Mutabi, is, is sitting correctly uh, in, in, the, in the, uh, the designed posture, but also has her hooker resting on a point. So there is a world of social interaction and cultural interaction and discovery on both sides, which is very different from the racial separation of the late 19th and early 20th century. I don't know if it's any better or any worse than what the East India Company did, but it is different. Uh, and just as you have this cultural exploration in two directions in, in social manners uh, and in sexuality, so in art you get the two worlds coming together. And this is a picture of, one of probably one of the leading Delhi artists, Mazur Ali Khan, I think. Um, it's not signed, and we don't know, but it's, it's from his workshop, and it's probably a self-portrait. And if you see in this picture, Mazur Ali Khan is sitting in the traditional Mughal posture for painting. He's resting back on a bolster, he's got one leg raised up, and he's painting on a wooden board, about six inches from his face. Uh, and uh, uh, he has a, a, a fine squirrel hair brush, probably with one single hair uh, it, uh, to paint with. But if you look carefully at what he's painting with, on the ground, either side, in the middle of those two set boxes, are mogul pigments made of uh, ground minerals, such as la lapis and malachite and so on. But in those boxes, you can see two very early imported sets of English watercolours. He's also wearing English spectacles. Uh, and uh, the album which this is part of is drawn on Watman's English watercolour. So you have the beginning of the same sort of thing as you see in the dress of Wunwell or Ashraf Ali Khan. Uh, you see uh, two artistic worlds coming together to create something slightly different, a new hybrid. And this is true also of another of the great artist portraits of this time, recently um, uh, discovered, uh, and uh, which was up for sale in Sotheby's about three years ago, and has now been bought by an Indian client. And this is an artist whose work has been known for a while, but we didn't know his name until this album turned up, because he has a self-portrait at the very end of it. And his name is Yalapa of Velour. Uh, and as you can see, he's this incredibly confident self-portrait of this man staring uh, straight in the eye of the viewer uh, with a very searching artist's eye. He's painted down on a tea chest which is propped up on two chocks on either side. And he has his two assistants, one of whom holds a sort of rag, presumably to clean uh, this album with, and the other one is holding actually the album in which this painting is still bound. 
uh, exactly that uh, blue leather binding and that shape and size uh, uh, is, is still the album this picture is contained within. And like Masrani Khan, uh, Yalapa of Velour is got on the ground uh, Mughal oyster shells in which he's m mixed his uh, mineral pigments, but on top he's got his English watercolours. Uh, and he is, uh, he is painting, uh, you can see, actually the self-portrait that we see in front of us. So, this new layer of European influence that you see entering Indian painting in the 1760s, 1770s, 1780s, is coming on top of a long Europeanizing trend in Indian painting that's been the case since the Mughal period. Here in front of us we have a gorgeous um, uh, late Jahangir, early Shah Jahan period set of flower studies. But look what Ebba Koch found that it was based on. Uh, this is a, uh, a German um, uh, original from the period of, of Dürer. Just go back and just look at the, the similarity of those two. Likewise, this is something I took on the Madhudana, which is just a lovely uh, inlay, Pietro Dura inlay of, um, of uh, Narcissus, um, or maybe um, tobacco flowers uh, in a vase. Um, and look how closely these vases are based on uh, European riddles. So the point is that this is not Europeanizing influence on mobile art, it's not something new. This is something that's been infused into the essence of mobile art since the Portuguese started giving uh, Bible pictures to Appa. Um, and uh, this tradition of painting nature in a semi-Europeanized style, but in one that is deeply mobile at the same time, is something that of course is mastered first by Mansour. And we get with Manohar and Mansour and the artists of the Jahangir period, um, this wonderful variety of animal portraits. So there's a, uh, a strong indigenous Mughal tradition of painting flowers and painting uh, animals, but they always tend to be in a landscape, often a paradise landscape. It isn't a realistic landscape, it's a landscape filled with irises and narcissuses, with, with bees and butterflies flying around. Um, uh, these peacocks um, are are incredibly full of light, but they're in the landscape. It's not a white background. These are accurate botanical studies, but they're also sort of animal portraits. Um, and they capture the essence of the bird or the beast as much as its scientific reality. Which meant that when English botanists and zoologists wanted to use Indian artists to record the new world that they had found, they already had a deep pool of artistic talent who were not just painting nawabs and court scenes and emperors and, and, and gentlemen in armour on, horse, on horseback. There was a, a very strong mogul tradition of painting animals, usually in profile, usually in landscapes, um, but accurately depicted with every single pattern or every single feather beautifully expressed. So when Claude Martin decides to start getting Indian artists to paint botanical pictures, he has two ideas in mind. On one hand, he's just imported from France uh, a book called Les Roiseaux de France, which is a four-volume book of botanical and zoological specimens, but mainly um, uh, centered around these wonderful bird studies. Uh, and Claude Martin, as you all know, the man who started the Lamartine School and uh, this famous French businessman, philanthropist, man of enlightenment, uh, was a man who took his learning and arts very, very seriously, as well as making a fortune in armaments uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, 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 Buildings, some gorgeous buildings in Lucknow. Uh, he also um, kept very strongly abreast of current scientific thought in Europe. So when he finds that the Montgolfier brothers had put up a hot air balloon in Paris, he gets the scientific journals in which they put their 
uh, their studies in and gives it important to Lucknow, and he puts his own hot air balloon up ten years later. Even more remarkably, when he finds himself having crippling stomach aches, he reads the scientific journals and then extracts his own appendix um, uh, 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 himself using a scalpel uh, and lives to tell the tale. Um, and Thomas had from his base, La Matinia, uh, the current uh, uh, La Matinia school, uh, which was his, he built as his final house and, and resting place, had not yet been built in the 1770s. Uh, and initially he was based on this building on the left, which was the, uh, called the, uh, um, uh, the, what's it called, the Chateau de, um, de Marseille, whatever, whatever, whichever French town he was from. Uh, and in this town, he, in this building, he collected artists and, and, uh, and this little salon is an example of Claude Martin's world. He is standing uh, three from the right in the red coat, pointing at a painting. Uh, behind him is the artist Zoffany, uh, painting uh, a picture uh, of a banyan tree. Zofany is the only royal academician who was also a cannibal on his way back from India. He was shipwrecked and had to eat one of the sailors who was there to shipwreck with him. Uh, this is a detail he didn't advertise when he got back home. Uh, then on the left is Colonel Pollier, and Pollier is an extraordinary figure. All his letters survive, and he was one of the very first to um, employ Lucknow artists to record the world around him. Uh, and um, he uh, employed a whole variety of Lucknowby masters. Uh, a lot of the work survives in the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris uh, and also uh, uh, in, in various English collections. He only made one big mistake, which was to return um, uh, to France and build a very large, a buy a very large chateau in 1788, one year before the French Revolution. Uh, and he subsequently uh, suffered the, the, the wrath of the guillotine. Uh, so he has an unhappy ending. So this little Enlightenment world is full of Europeans in touch with Enlightenment thought in Europe, but operating in a Mughal world uh, where they're employing Mughal artists. And Claude Martin is the first that seems to have made the, the, the realisation that he can get European-style animal portraits. This is, is the, the period when Linnaeus is still alive in Sweden, classifying the different, uh, naming the different names, finding scientific ways of classifying different genuses of plants and so on. And this passion moves to London where Joseph Banks has just come back from the South Seas with Captain Cook where he's been painting and collecting specimens, Kew Gardens have just been founded. And it's become for the first time a serious fad among educated gentlefolk of the Enlightenment to take an interest in botany and zoology. And this popular La Zoo de France that uh, Paul Martin imports uh, is part of this sort of post uh, Linnaean um, fad for natural history painting. And Claude Martin seems to have got Pommier's painters uh, and to have used, shown them this French model book. And here is the results. This is Claude Martin and one well. This is the first Claude Martin commission that we have, probably from about 1765-70. He imported in those years 30,000 30, sheets of English watercolour paper to Lucknow. Uh, so it was clearly intent on a very large scale uh, exploration. And this is a very straightforwardly Lucknowy portrait. Now that we have pictures by an artist called Bahadur Singh uh, of a of mullahs and noblemen against this very Lucknowy background, this sort of Lilliput landscape of miniaturised trees uh, with, the, with normally the uh, the nobleman standing out of it like sort of Godzilla, this sort of giant standing above this miniature landscape. And in this case, the Godzilla is the stork. But later on, Claude Martin gets his artist to paint uh, in the same style uh, as the birds in Les Oiseaux de France. Uh, and his pictures of his falcons, dating from about 1760 to 65, are against a white background in a way that no Mansour picture had ever been. But there is the same incredibly detailed way of showing every feather, every single marking in the, in the bird's feet, every single um, variation in their feathers. This is a Claude Martin cobra. 
Uh, again, you have this sort of ability that these mobile artists have to do not just a scientific study, but actually a portrait of the animal. You get a sense of its, uh, its being, its, its, its character, its essence. And yet, beneath, we have this thoroughly scientific cross-section of its skull. Uh, again, something you'd never find on a, on a straightforwardly mogul print. And in the course of putting this exhibition together, uh, we found 3,000 Claude Martin um, botanical pictures done about 20 years after the birds in the 1790s, uh, which had not only never been published before, but were sitting in a box in Kew Gardens that hadn't even got accession numbers. They hadn't even been accession, never mind catalogued or published. And uh, the wonderful Henry Nolte, who who's for years has worked on the Indian um, uh, flower portraits uh, in Edinburgh, uh, I, I encouraged him to go down to Kew and have a look. And we found this within a month, 3,000 extraordinary, previously unseen Claude Martin pictures. Previously unseen and previously unpublished is significant here because um, this is an odd thing that these should be unclassified, that they should not be published, that they have not been valued and exhibited. And it's part of this general post-colonial embarrassment. The Brits, after the loss of their empire, didn't know what to do with all this stuff. And in general, they tended to take it off the walls of their art galleries and to, uh, or maybe demote it. So for example, Lady Butler's um, famous picture of the retreat from Kabul with Dr. Bryden on his pony, the last survivor of the retreat from Kabul, which was the single most popular painting in the date of the 19th century, in 1955 gets sent off to a regimental museum in Somerset. Similar pictures from New Zealand and Australia get sent off to the colonies. Uh, and there has never been an exhibition of what used to be called company school painting. Not a phrase, incidentally, we use at any point in this exhibition because we think it privileges the company over the Indian artists. We try and emphasize in this exhibition the extraordinary talent of Ghulam Ali Khan, Yalapur Valor, these artists who have names, who have biographies, and who deserve to be known uh, like the greatest artists uh, of Europe, like uh, uh, Raphael or Michelangelo or Leonardo. These should be names that run off people's tongues and, and people are taught in school. And so the problem with this exhibition, and the reason it's called Forgotten Masters, is this stuff has never been exhibited. It's never been shown before in public in Britain. There was a show in New York in 1978, created by Stuart Kerry Welsh, called Room for Wonder. There was one last year in uh, Mumbai, and there will be another one in Calcutta, using the Victoria Memorial collections in a couple of years. Uh, but it is a measure of, the, I mean, the tra this hybrid art, in a sense, has muddled everyone because it doesn't fit neatly into any box. It's not quite mogul, it's not quite Indian, neither is it British. And so people have just sort of left it uh, and, and forgotten these incredibly, uh, these incredibly talented artists whose work um, you'll be seeing over the next 40 minutes. So this fashion, which seems to start in Lucknow with Claude Martin in the 1760s, 1770s, um, passes to Calcutta, where the botanic gardens are founded very early on. Um, like everything to do with the company, it's primarily about money, it's about trade. Um, the, the botanic gardens exist to uh, test uh, what, what species can be brought in from, say, the Caribbean uh, or Indonesia can, uh, can flourish in Indian soil. But these botanic gardens are run by a succession, particularly of Scots, uh, but botanists who have their own scientific interests. So while working for a capitalist corporation that is only interested in profit, they use the opportunity to explore the natural world around them, partly presumably with a view to making their reputation as great botanists. You know, Joseph Banks at the same period had become one of the most famous scientists in Britain thanks to his, uh, his exploration of the birds and, and, uh, and beasts of the South Seas. So we get James Kerr, uh, who's one of the very first men running the Calcutta Botanic Gardens in Simple, employing an artist called Bawani Das, who is from Patna, uh, but presumably started off in the Murshidabad court, painting this very large double A3 spread of a gorgeous study of, of mangoes, green mangoes. And Kerr and Claude Martin were friends of a man called Elijah Impey, who comes out to be the first 
uh, boss of the Calcutta High Court. And while um, the Botanic Garden artists are employing these artists to paint a whole variety uh, of different um, uh, botanical specimens, um, um, Impey uh, is protecting his menagerie in Park Street, and we'll hear more of him in a second. So a whole variety of different artists at work. Many of them are local artists trained in the local tradition, but not all of them are. Vishnu Prasad is, um, but he, he appears, you can see the sort of strangeness of the specimen in his eyes. He's looking at this with eyes of wonder uh, as he looks at this specimen, including all sorts of details that Mansoor would never have had, like cross-sections uh, and so on. Um, again, this is a, a commercial company, so coffee is one of the most uh, common things growing in the gardens. Uh, um, as are, of course, poppies, uh, the beginning of the opium trade. But look at the beauty of this dying poppy. With two, two or three of its petals have already gone. You'll see the, the, the heads now heavy, uh, uh, about to grow opium. And then this sort of strange specimen of club moss. Picture plants that look better than photographed by Robert Maplethorpe. A piece of ginger. Look at the root systems there. Look at the detail with which these things are painted and the extraordinary tricks of perspective that you have with the uh, leaf. Now look at how three-dimensional Munalal's mogul training is and compare that to what comes next. Now Rangya was working uh, for the Botanic Garden uh, on the coast north of Machli Patnam, on the Andhra coast. And of course there are no mogul artists down there. So in order to... which what. Well, what painters could the botanists recruit for this job? They had to recruit, of course, Kalamkari painters. So these are guys who had learned their craft painting textile patterns. And it's a completely different tradition of painting, and much flatter. Compare the depth of Munalal's mogul technique to the flatness of Rungia's. But Rungia is true to his Kalamkari traditions in that he has uh, look at the way he takes these tendrils on a dance to fill the, the, the white space. He hates the idea of leaving some of the paper unused. So the tendrils drift off artistically into the corners um, where they waltz with each other and, and, and perform wonderful uh, little foxtrots in the corners. We get uh, Bishop Assad doing these gorgeous uh, fan horns. Pandanas palms, and this is the efflorescence of the pandanas palm. These are, these are uh, pairs of pictures. And here we finally come to Lady Impey. So Lady Impey arrives aged 18 in Park Street. Uh, she's married this much older, much richer man, um, and her big passion when she was growing up in Oxfordshire was the birds and beasts, and she kept a little nature journal before she came out. But uh, now married to this, uh, this potentate in Calcutta, she can do things on a much bigger scale. Um, and having initially recruited artists to paint her children's nursery, uh, and look at these, there's a guy on the left being breastfed by a wet nurse, there's uh, other little children running around like white ghosts um, in the eyes of the artist. Uh, uh, and then finally they're set to work on Lady in Peace Menagerie. And look at the results. This is one of the first things done by Sheikh Zainuddin in, I think, 1778. It's on a white background, but look how similar it is to Mansour's work 200, 150 years earlier. This is a Mansour Nilgai, and there we have Impi Samba. It's exactly the same natural history technique. The mystery is we don't have any mogul natural history pictures between the period of Jahangir and the Impis. There's this gap, and suddenly, maybe just because the training was there, maybe because the way of looking was the same, um, uh, but somehow you have the, the spirit of Mansour reawakened after 150 years sleep. Um, this is an uh, uh, Zainuddin cheetah. There's a large picture, by the way. This is double A3, the size. Um, they're gorgeous, big, beautiful. Uh, studies of animals. Look at the, the, the pleasure that Zainuddin has taken in the spotting of this cheetah. Or the, uh, compare that to a Mansour zebra. You see, they're very similar. 
and this um, pangolin that seems to have sort of wandered in from a Disney film, um, padding across Lady Impey's Park. We get a Malabar giant squirrel nibbling at a uh, nut. Uh, the the Urdu just says Pari Chua. Uh, it's rather less uh, gamely than a Malabar giant squirrel. And these fantastically elegant studies of storks that look like they come off some ancient Japanese uh, ink uh, scroll. Um, in fact, they were collected by a, uh, the, the, the main collector of the MP album was a Texan bull semen millionaire who'd, who'd sold his bull semen across America uh, and who collected Japanese art and actually bought some of these thinking they were Japanese before discovering they were Indian. Uh, and uh, I continued to collect. Uh, and then I uh, in the Massachusetts in uh, Institute of Art, the MIA, and kindly led for the show. All these images were split up on the death of the MPs and distributed around the world. And this uh, the show is the first time that we've had most of them put back together uh, in, the, in the Wallace collection. This one used to belong to Jackie Kennedy. Um, it's a stork eating a snail. And you just extracted the end of the snail out of the, out of the shell at the bottom. Pelicans. This one's got a whole sort of David Attenborough nature program going. You, you start off, I suppose, with the, uh, um, uh, the caterpillar. Uh, the caterpillar is sitting there in the middle, nibbling the leaves. Uh, it then uh, turns into a cocoon, which you can see on the left hand side, hanging from a a branch, uh, then um, pupates into this gorgeous uh, uh, moth uh, and then is about to be eaten by this bird. So the whole sort of life cycle of this animal uh, in one wonderful study. Uh, this one always makes me wonder whether these birds were painted from life or whether they were painted dead. Um, this incredibly beautiful fan of the uh, of the uh, uh, wing and the way that the bird is, is cleaning under the wing could be a study taken from life uh, sitting in a uh, lady in peace parkland or it might have been um, a dead, a dead uh, bird fixed in rigor mortis in that slightly uncomfortable position I don't know Obadon in, in the States later than this painted mainly from dead specimens and uh, particularly when we get to some of the creepy crawlies I imagine that they probably prefer to paint them dead but we'll see the snakes in a minute. This is a wonderful Sheikh Zainuddin black hooded oil with the, the yellow uh, of the bird reflected in the bark. Uh, but can you see the almost invisible the camouflaged insect, insect on the left hand side of the tree trunk? Um, whose two um, feelers are propelling up. Uh, it's a gorgeous piece of work. Now this looks like it should be attached to Sigourney Weiner's face in, a, uh, in some uh, uh, sci-fi movie, but it is in fact Sheikh Zainuddin's study of a horseshoe crab with all the horror uh, that the Sheikh seems to have felt for this creature emanating from this very sinister image. And uh, it does, at some point, Sheikh Zainuddin seems to, who seems to be like a grand figure um, and, and a master artist, called two assistants to come and help him. And poor Bawani Das and Ramdas keep giving the creepy crawlies and the snakes to paint uh, while the Sheikh paints the nice big comfy mammals. Um, so this is Bawani Das who's given the cobra. Um, and this horrible, uh, threatening looking bandit crate. And this is my favorite of all. This is a fantastically masculine bat uh, with his arm outstretched as if rather than some creature from a uh, uh, colonial menagerie, uh, if he is instead some commendatory uh, ushering a woman into an Italian opera house with all the panache. Have you ever seen such a, uh, such a dashing bat in all your travels? And this is his girlfriend. <laughs> And this is his mother-in-law. <laughs> but Ronnie Das again gets given the lizards and the kind of slightly creepy catfish and the puffer fish. And, and at some stage, Zenidin packs up and goes back to Patna, leaving Ram Das and Bawani Das to finish the commission. So he starts in about 1778 
and Ram Das comes I think in 1780 and they're still painting in 1782 finishing off the, uh, the, the river fish and other strange creatures of the Bengali waterways. Meanwhile, another, uh, the, 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 uh, this fad, uh, this, uh, this uh, trend has been picked up by, um, by other collectors. Uh, Lord Wellesley arriving in Calcutta starts a menagerie himself in Barrackpool and in the original stipulation that he lays down to the government he, he puts money aside for artists to paint the Barrackpool menagerie. And one of these is a Bengali artist called Haluda. Um, and if you can just see in the bottom right hand corner there are two inscriptions. One is about uh, an inch uh, from the bottom and it says Haluda pinks it. So, uh, Francis Buchanan, who, who, who'd run the menagerie, was impressed enough by Hallodar's work to record his name. And as you can see, it's very much a, a style of his own. He's, he uses pen and ink and wash, um, and he has great fascination with how fur works, the different patterns and colorings and, uh, uh, and, and, and the different ways that uh, this given. This gorgeous pair of field mice that look like they're sort of Beatrix Spotter escapees, the very essence of mousiness. Um, gorgeous little creatures. And this poor bear that looks like it's trodden on a uh, sort of scientific, uh, on a sort of electronic cable or something, all this current, the current raising its hairs in all sorts of strange ways. And look of surprise. Then from the Botanic Gardens, the, uh, the fad passes out into Calcutta proper. And Sheikh Mohammed Amir, who, according to tradition, is from the same family as Sheikh Zainuddin, and was, uh, he calls himself Sheikh Mohammed Amir in Karia, Karia being just around the corner from where uh, the Impies worked out of Park Street. Uh, and so if Sheikh Zainuddin settled down in Calcutta when he was painting for the Impies, it's quite possible that Sheikh Mohammed Amir um, set up around the corner. And this, uh, he sets himself up not as part of uh, any um, uh, botanic garden or, or working for the Impies. He has his own studios and he does bespoke images of sort of colonial households and uh, particularly for the English, their dogs and their horses, which they always care so passionately about. And um, there are so, this is some fascinating images by him. Now, this image of a little English girl. In, on horseback, riding side saddle. Now, what is going on in this picture? The three servants, the groom and the ayah, uh, not the ayah, the, the kind of, uh, uh, maybe the, the uh, hazeldar, uh, are given full humanity. They have their faces shown, you can see their characters, their fully expressed humanity. But the girl is invisible. She's hidden inside her bonnet. And even her hands are covered in blood. She has no, there's nothing of her except her outfit. Now, what is happening here? Is this a Muslim artist not wanting to show the Saab's daughter or showing sort of um, reverence for women or respect for women? Uh, or is there some sort of um, resistance here? Is Sheikh Mohammed Amir somehow thinking this woman is not entirely human, that she's somehow just a, a bonnet on a horse? Um, you can read it different ways, but it's a curious, it's a curious thing. Um, lots of horses, as I say. Some dogs. The, the dog on the left, uh, the dog on the, on the left is called General, and the dog on the right is called Aya. Uh, but a wonderful study of two hunting dogs. Uh, Sheikh Mohammed specialises also in these wonderful studies of gigs. Then the Indianness of the delicacy of that picture. And look at how Sheikh Mohammed Amir is fascinated with the springing system and the gorgeous shapes made by it. He sees all sorts of things there that an English painter would not see in the shapes and the, uh, and the delicacy of the, of, of the engineering. He does hot Calcutta houses, um, in the middle of the, the heat of the Calcutta summer with kites circling in the background, with some, uh, some guy fishing in the pukur, getting lunch or dinner uh, from the fish pond, and the stork on the right standing very proprietorily uh, on the left of the picture as the heat of the afternoon. 
beats down on the, on the house with its shutters down. So this fashion then moves upstream in Patna, in Agra, uh, and in Agra, Sheikh Latif um, starts painting for passing tourists these perfect uh, elevations of Mughal monuments. Uh, it's scientifically incredibly accurate, but it's also got all the delicacy of Mughal painting. You feel that that uh, muslin could be blown away in a puff of wind, so delicate to the Jalis, uh, and so refined are the, uh, uh, and, and, and um, light are those uh, perforated screens. He's interested in pattern, Sheikh Latif. He loves the, the way that the Mughal pavements at Agra um, form patterns and, and create perspectives that end in the central uh, window at the center of the picture. He does the same with the Jat Gardens of Deeg. Uh, but the master of all of them is the great Gunam Ali Khan painting out of Delhi. And now Gunam Ali Khan has a long life. He first turns up, and, and Yutuka Sharma has shown this in, in some extraordinary research he's done lately, as a uh, painter attached to the Daniels, where, uh, Thomas and William Daniel, when they're doing their uh, camera obscura work uh, in Agra, producing what will become the, their, their great uh, uh, multi-volume work on, on the monuments of Hindustan. And young um, Gulam Ali Khan is with them and painting the Red Fort when they come to Delhi. But he then continues what he's learned, mixing his Mughal techniques with, with the new uh, fashion of European landscape pictures to produce works like this. This is the bottom of the Qutb Minar with Adam Khan's tomb uh, and the Alai Darwaza on the left. Uh, he works for James Skinner, the Anglo-Indian mercenary. This is James Skinner's house on the left with James Skinner's church in the middle and the tomb of William Fraser in between the two, the little white a mausoleum between the mosque and the church. Uh, and we know from the Palace Diary, uh, I found that the Palace Diary was doing last Mughal reference to Gulam Ali Khan being, uh, being Zaf Parasha Zafar's court architect. So as well as a painter, he was used by Zafar to draw elevations for architecture, for projects that Zafar was building, like Zafar Mahal uh, and the last pavilion in the Red Fort in, in Zafar's garden. And uh, you can see that sort of draftsman-like quality in this study of the interior of uh, St. James's Church. Look at the sophistication with which he's drawn the, um, uh, the screen uh, apparatus in the center of the arch, uh, with all that cross-rigging, like it looks like a sailing ship about to take a uh, sail off into the distance. He also works, of course, for the imperial court. He's the, he's the main court artist. He calls himself Palace Ball. And he paints for the noblemen of the court, including Nawab Jaja, riding his tiger as one does on a hot summer afternoon. Um, <laughs> perfect weather for a nice tiger ride, uh, thinks uh, Nawab Jaja. Uh, of course, it, it was not clear whether this is a metaphor or not, whether he actually did saddle a, a tiger and ride around with it or whether this was a symbol, and, and certainly, symbolically, uh, Jaja uh, fell off his tiger, so to speak, because he got hung in 1858 at the end of the uprising. This is Ustad Himat Khan, who was the, kind of, uh, the Keith Richards of the Mughal court. Um, he was blind, but he was a great rock star. He was considered the greatest satirist of his day. And despite being blind, he succeeded in impregnating one of Zafar's concubines uh, in 1855, which was very good timing because he got banished to Hyderabad and managed to escape the Great Uprising when most of the rest of the court was hung and, and hunted down. Uh, so he kept the Delhi Garama going uh, by, uh, by this, this gallant act of impregnation. Uh, and these are the great dancing girls from the Fraser album. Uh, Pari Khan Hanegi, who would still cut quite a dash in, in Haskar's village if he were to go down wearing that on a Friday night in her Uber. Uh, Raoji uh, painting her, her rival Malagwa uh, and uh, Kandabaksh. And this is all the work of uh, commissions from the Fraser family. And William Fraser was the 
the resident at the Mughal court, the ambassador, who became so Indianized that, that, that he got a ticking off from the commander-in-chief's wife, uh, Lady Hood, who, uh, uh, sorry, Lady Nugent, uh, who, said, who, who ticked him off for not eating pork or beef, uh, and for uh, having grown a beard like a Rajput, uh, and, uh, and told me he hoped, she hoped he would not forget his, his native Christianity. But uh, William Fraser seems to have done exactly that, and thoroughly uh, fascinated by everything he saw in Delhi, he became a friend of Sheikh Abdul Aziz, who was the leading uh, Sufi divine at the time. Uh, he uh, spoke perfect Persian Hindustani, and he worked with his best friend James Skinner to raise Skinner's horse. And his troops and Skinner's horse were, uh, were interchangeable. Uh, this is his, his bodyguard, Kala, who saved his life by killing a tiger with that sword. Uh, and this is a double portrait. On the left is the picture of Kala as he came out of the Haryana bush with his sort of dirty dope, dopey and this sort of very misshapen turban um, and this rather sort of, um, sort of hunky, hunky junk body. Uh, and there on the right uh, is after a shampoo and blow dry and a little session at the Oberoi, uh, at the Oberoi Salon um, wearing his Napoleonic outfit uh, with this odd sort of shave right hat. Um, and uh, uh, William Fraser crest, the Fraser heart head, is on the cross sash uh, on that badge that he's wearing. So it's, 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 he's shown before and after. Incidentally, Fraser had a great fascination for Napoleon. And when he found that Napoleon had been given no books by his jailers on St. Helena, he packed up his entire Oriental Library and sent it off to St. Helena as a present for Napoleon. Uh, and it sank on the way, but Napoleon got to hear uh, that he'd sent the, all these incredible presents. And as a thank you, he sent his signet ring uh, and the last uh, statue he had of himself, which was a bust he commissioned earlier from Canova. So the, the signet ring and the, and the bus turned up in Delhi three years later. Um, and then when it got, after, after Fraser's assassination, it was bought or was taken by Thomas Metcalf. And when Metcalf's house burned down in 1857 during the uprising, uh, it disappeared and was found in 1858 being worshipped in a Shiva temple as an image of Mahadev. <laughs> Sadly, what happened to it after that is not recorded. We don't, there is no, there is no Canova Napoleon bust in Delhi today, as far as I know. But uh, uh, somewhere there must be this famous Shavite Napoleon. <laughs> I'm very intrigued by these hats, which, which um, someone uh, who knows the stuff better than I should be able to tell. What, whether is 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 that a half moon necessarily Shavite, but put with a tiger skin? Is that meant to? denote some sort of uh, sectarian uh, affiliation, or is it just decoration? But it's a very, these are very dashing chaps, as you can see. Um, this is Umi Chand. And again, you get these pictures of, of the recruits for Skinner's Horse, half in, half out of their Haryan V dotis, uh, uh, on their way to, one of them is wearing their smart new Skinner's Horse outfit, and the rest are all as uh, new recruits, fresh out the fields. But Fraser also records noblemen. This is the young uh, Ajit Singh of Patiala. Uh, these are Afghan mercenaries. I love the guy, one from the left, armed to the hilt. He's got a pistol, three, two swords, a quiver of arrows and a bow, um, and a prayer uh, rosary. <laughs> uh, and he's ready to take on anyone. Uh, he wouldn't like to run into these four on a dark night in Daria Gunj. <laughs> and uh, this is them, these same guys from the village, halfway to becoming Skinner's Horse recruits. Uh, more figures from Patiala. And this is a fascinating one. Again, a pic one of these pictures that you can read in quite different ways. On one hand, this is a picture of colonialism in action. On the right hand side of the picture, you've got William Fraser's two, his Duan and his Man of Business. Uh, surveying all the land records of this village in Haryana, Rania, where Fraser's girlfriend was based. And so all those bundle of documents in the front are the land grants, and people are proving how much land they, and this is the kind of, uh, 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 this is a, a kind of survey for tax purposes of how, how much land everyone owned. Um, 
But equally, you can look at it as a very democratic picture because Mughal artists never painted portraits of villagers. We, have, we know what the noblemen look like. We know sometimes what the holy men, the Sufis look like. Uh, we know what the generals look like. But you don't get this, which is individual portraits of ordinary villagers from the Haryana countryside. These faces are still there today. Uh, these clothes are still there today. Um, they're rapidly being replaced by baseball cuts and jeans, the closer you get to Delhi. And um, you can look at it as, as a picture of colonialism. You can look at it as the first democratic picture of Indian villagers. Um, with not types, but these are, each one of these is a portrait. Each one has a number. You can see it most clearly in this slide to the right of the, uh, the, the first figure on the, uh, to the, uh, on the right of the foursome at the top of the picture uh, has a number next to it. But each one of them is numbered and the names and the details of each is given. You have celebrity mendicants. Um, the uh, uh, Lakshman Das was, uh, uh, didn't seem to have a chain of Ayurvedic stores like Patanjali or anything yet, but uh, is well on the way to, to being the uh, TV sadhu of his day. And this is, um, this is William Fraser's girlfriend, who was called Amiban, on the left, his daughter in the middle, and uh, Salabat Bhatti, who was the, her father, who was the headman of the village in Rania, and his, his Fraser's bearded mother-in-law on the right of the picture. Um, and again, these are kind of extraordinary intimate pictures of people who are part of Fraser's everyday life. He also had, a, had an arms business importing horses from Afghanistan, which he did with Ghalib's uncle and with um, uh, James Skinner. And, and these are the Afghans who came down with the horses from the hills uh, every winter. So gradually, this mixed style, part English, part Mughal, gives way to increasing colonization. And the artist who shows the first signs of actually trying to copy the picturesque, which had done so well for the Hodges, is a Murshidabad artist called Sita Ram. The first works we have of Sita Ram are Murshidabad style. The second sort of phase is he's painting insects um, in Calcutta. And by the 1820s, he's learned to paint in this Europeanized picturesque, uh, in the style of the Hodges and the Daniels. And he, like those paintings, makes things up. This is no longer the strict scientific recording that you find with Sheikh Latif, um, recording exactly the elevation of the Taj. Um, Sita Ram uh, puts things to make it look pretty. So you'll see the Taj Mahal is mysteriously in the background of this image here uh, of Agra. In fact, that's not possible for, to see the Taj from where the great gun was uh, located, but he's put it there. And I think that looks rather like um, I think Akbar's tomb in Sekunder on the right of the far bank, uh, all clustered around. So he was just trying to give an impression, a picturesque impression. Uh, and we end up back where we started at La Martinia. This is uh, the last of the Sita Rams. Uh, uh, this is a firework display put on for the victory at Amiens, uh, which Napoleon's first defeat in 18, uh, 1805. And uh, what's happening in the centre of the picture is Claude Martin's obelisk, which was built to, as a memorial, is still covered in scaffolding. Uh, in the middle of the lake. But this, uh, this Sita Ram seems to be channeling uh, Turner. You can see all the fireworks exploding in the background and the silhouettes of the people watching the firework display at the bottom of the picture with their arms outstretched in wonder. So with Sita Ram, we come, in a sense, to the end of this story. We start off with, with Mughal painters painting in Mughal style. We work through painters painting in a hybrid style that's part anglicised and part Mughal, and we end up with the shape of things to come, which is Indian painters forgetting their own traditions and realizing that they can get more employment by painting in a European style. What happens next is the European art schools in Lahore, John Lockwood Kipling, and the Europeanization of Indian art and the end of these incredibly valuable traditions. But the point of this show is to show that there is a period of transition where you have some of the greatest Mughal painters producing major artworks that have never been celebrated properly. 